Hey, good morning and welcome to Church at Home. If this is your first time with us or you're new, you can head to hermersonassembly.com slash connect, fill out a connect card and our team would love to get you a free gift this week. Also, if you need prayer or assistance with anything, you can go to hermersonassembly.com slash prayer, fill out a prayer card and our team would love to be praying for you in any way that we can. Again, thank you so much for joining us and we are so excited for what God wants to do in your homes today.
Good morning and welcome to Hermiston Assembly. We're so glad that you're here. If this is your first time with us, head over to hermistonassembly.com slash connect and fill out our online connect card. Let us know you stopped by. We'd love to get you a gift this week. And if you need prayer, or if you have a physical need you'd like to let us know about, head over to hermersonassembly.com slash prayer and fill out our online prayer card. Uh, let us know how we can be praying for you or how we can serve you this week. Today, after the service from noon to one, we're gonna be having our guest lunch here at the Hermiston Assembly campus. If you've just joined our church within the last six months, we invite you to come and meet our staff. We would love the opportunity to connect with you. Next week, we're starting a brand new series called Family Matters. It's all about family and community. We have some exciting stuff prepared. You don't wanna miss it. Thank you for your continued generosity and giving here at Hermiston Assembly. There are many ways in which you can give. You can head over to hermistonassembly.com give. It's super easy and secure that way. You can also download our church app. Just search Hermiston Assembly on the App Store or the Google Play Store. And if you're a cash or check donor, we do have a secure lockbox located outside our church office that you can stop on by and drop off your gift at, or you can continue to mail in your gift as well. Our address is listed on our website. Thanks again for your financial support of Hermes and Assembly. Your contribution makes this ministry possible. And now Pastor Terry's gonna come up and give us a message from God's word. Tonight, the CDC is confirming the first case in the US of a new and deadly coronavirus. <laughs> I'm not going to answer the question because, because the question is... Good morning, Hermiston Assembly family and friends. Uh, we, if you're joining us for the first time, if you've come across this uh, stream, this rebroadcast, uh, we welcome you this morning. Uh, this is such a wonderful time of year. If you were with us last Sunday, uh, we celebrated the resurrection of Jesus. And, uh, and many people that day made a decision to serve him, to follow him. Uh, the prophet Isaiah talks about today is the day of salvation. There's no better day than today. And as we do every Sunday, we're going to be giving opportunity here at the end of this message. Uh, if you have yet to experience the love of God or to know Jesus, um, we want to give you that opportunity today. Uh, as we go into the message this morning, um, I, before I get to that point, I want to share with you of an exciting event coming up in just a few weeks. Uh, in On May 1st, Saturday, and May 2nd, that Sunday, the next day, uh, we're having an I Love My City weekend. Uh, we do this a few times a year with other churches. In fact, we have seven churches that are all joining in. All of us are doing this together but we'll be going out on Saturday, May 1st from nine to noon uh, to love our city in practical ways, um, different projects and opportunities there. And so if you want more information or if you wanna be a part of this, uh, go to ilovehermiston.com, ilovehermiston.com. And you'll be able to sign up there. If you need a t-shirt, we have the, the uh, Signet t-shirts that we use that say, I love my city on, on the front of it. And we want you to be a part of it with us, join us. Uh, we do things that we uh, collaborate with our city, uh, such as downtown cleanup, railroad cleanup, some landscaping, spreading bark, things like that. And then we look for other ways uh, just to love our community um, uh, in practical ways, whether it's a car wash or going to the laundromat and paying for someone's laundry, they're washing and drying, or, um, or doing block parties, uh, or doing prayer booth. People can drive up and get prayer. Uh, we have various ways and opportunities that we can love people. And of course, we love people because God loves people and we love what God loves. And so, as you know, one of our mottos here is that, that uh, this is not, you know, loving people is not an event, it's a lifestyle. And so, but on these days of the year, we take time to do it together, but really this should be a lifestyle daily. And so uh, come join us on that day and be a part of that. So can't wait for that. So today on this 11th day of April, uh, I want to uh, bring you a word uh, today out of the book of Matthew chapter three. This is kind of a standalone message. It's a little bit of a bonus message to the series we just finished, Above the Noise. Uh, hopefully you enjoyed that and appreciated uh, the words that were shared by various 
uh, staff members, pastors here at Hermiston Assembly. Um, but today I wanna talk about breaking the silence, breaking the silence. Uh, while there is a lot of noise all around us, in fact, I would say it's come even to a fever pitch when it comes to the types of noises that we've been uh, experiencing. Um, ultimately, as you remember last Sunday, we talked about it all coming from sin, that fall, that uh, like that water flooding in like a, onto a sinking ship, the noise of culture, politics, media, um, religion, all this noise is always trying to inundate uh, our hearts and minds. Uh, but we're told that we can live not only above it, but Jesus, the way he lived his life, he lived not only above it, and, but he lived free of it. And so I pray that you're experiencing freedom as well, uh, not just dealing with it, not just coping with it. We're not just to cope with it, but rather we're to live in victory above and beyond it. And so, but today I wanna talk about a different kind of noise. Uh, this is not the noise of culture, religion, um, media, things like that, uh, but rather there is a certain sound that comes from heaven. Uh, we're living in a day, I believe, where there is a lack of the word of the Lord or uh, people who are, who are coming to the forefront, coming to the surface and speaking what God is saying not only to the church, but even to the lost, people who don't know him. And I was reading this passage at the beginning of this week, the day after Easter, and it really gripped my heart. And I felt like I wanted to bring this to you today about breaking the silence. Um, and you'll understand why as I get, what that means as I get into this passage. And so if you will, look with me to Matthew chapter three. I'm gonna be reading verses one through 12. And this is the story of John the Baptist. Uh, he was a forerunner to Jesus. In fact, he was the cousin of Jesus. If you remember uh, the story of Zechariah and his wife, uh, Elizabeth, they were in their 80s. And uh, the, an angel of the Lord appeared to Zechariah one day while he was serving in the temple and said, you're going to have a son and you'll call his name John. And he will be a forerunner to the Messiah. He'll be a spokesperson. He'll, he will declare that Jesus is coming. And so he, and then of course, Mary was learning from Gabriel that she was also gonna have a son and that his name would be called Jesus. And so now these two, these two men, John and Jesus, are at the age of 30. They're six months apart. Uh, but John would become a voice. He would step onto the, to the scene of human history and break a 400 year drought or a 400 year silence where people had not heard from God. And so in Matthew three, verse one through 12, it was at this time that John the baptizer began to preach in the desert of Judah. His message was this, heaven's kingdom is about to appear. So you'd better keep turning away from evil and turn back to God. Isaiah was referring to John, this is verse three. Isaiah was referring to John when he prophesied, a thunderous voice, one will be crying out in the wilderness, prepare yourselves for the coming of the Lord and level a straight path inside your hearts for him. Now, John wore clothing made from camel's hair, tied at his waist with a leather strap and his food consisted of dried locusts and wild honey. A steady stream of people from Jerusalem all and all the surrounding countryside and the region near Jordan came out to the wilderness to be baptized by him. And while they were publicly confessing their sins, he would immerse them in the Jordan River. Verse seven, but when he saw many coming from among the wealthy elite of the Jewish society and many of the religious leaders known as Pharisees coming to witness the baptism, he began to denounce them saying, you offspring or brood of vipers, who warned you uh, to slither away like snakes from the fire of God's judgment? You must prove your repentance by a changed life. And don't presume that you can get away with merely saying, th saying to yourselves, but we're Abraham's descendants or we're the sons of Abraham. For I tell you, God can awaken these stones to become sons of Abraham. 
The ax is now ready to, be, to, to cut down the tree at its very root. Every fruitless rotten tree will be chopped down and thrown into the fire. And those who repent, I will baptize in water. But there is coming a man after me who is more powerful than I. In fact, I'm not even worthy to pick up his sandals. He will submerge you with union with the spirit of holiness and with a raging fire. He comes with a winnowing fork in his hands and comes with his threshing floor uh, to, and comes to his threshing floor to sift what is worthless from what is pure. And he is ready to sweep out his threshing floor and gather his wheat into the granary. But the straw he will burn up with fire that can't be extinguished. And so today, as I, as I bring you this word, uh, I mentioned it a moment ago, but the last prophet, the last individual, the last man of God who spoke to the children of Israel was the prophet Malachi. Malachi's book, the last book of the Old Testament, uh, was written and spoken 400 years earlier. It had been 400 years since Israel had heard a real-time word from the Lord. It had been 400 years since they heard a prophet speak on behalf of God, saying, this is what God is saying to our nation. And so now we see John the Baptist steps on the scene and he breaks the silence. And you're gonna hear me say that phrase quite often here this morning, but he broke the silence by speaking a word of the Lord. I believe that uh, while there are so many voices, even good voices out there today, uh, I still believe that there is that that sound, that, that word, that uh, breath of God lacking when it comes to the, the world, comes to the lost. Um, again, there are so many noises, but there is a distinguished noise, a distinguished sound that cuts through all of that. Um, can I say it this way? Uh, it breaks the absence in the case of John, there had been an absence. There had been a there. There was no voice. There was no sound. There was no uh, word of the Lord for four hundred years. Uh, I believe that God is wanting to speak and is speaking. I should say, He is speaking uh, to the church and to the world. And who is He speaking through? He's speaking through men, women, boys, and girls that are willing to open their mouths and say, this is what God says. This is not only what his word says, but this is what he's saying to this generation. I believe God is wanting to bring something reviving and refreshing into the body of Christ. I believe God's calling men and women, uh, boys and girls, to have an encounter with him in such a way that, like Jeremiah the prophet says, it's like fire shut up in my bones. I cannot help but open my mouth and speak what God is saying. In fact, the Apostle Paul, if you're familiar with him, in the New, he wrote almost half of the New Testament. He would tell the young pastor Timothy in the book of 1 Timothy, he would say, when you open your mouth and when you begin to speak, speak as it were the very breath of God, the very words of God. Because I'm here to tell you today, people don't need our opinions. People don't need our, our spin on something. People don't need our in, in, in some measure, our psychology, our humanism. They don't need, you know, they don't need just kind words. They need to hear, we need to hear, I need to hear, what does God say about this situation? What is God speaking to us? What is God saying, not only to the church, but to the lost? What the world wants to hear is they wanna hear from God. They may not realize it, they may not understand it, they may not know it, but the aching in their heart, the confusion in their hearts and minds, all of those things need to be broken by the voice of God, by the word of the Lord. Uh, what they're, you know, while they're hearing all this noise, yet the one thing they're not hearing is what does God say? And I wanna challenge you, and I'm being challenged, what the world needs to hear is from God. They need to hear from their creator. They need to hear from the one who, the only one who can bring us hope, the only one who can bring salvation. And so we see here, I'm gonna highlight a few qualities about John the Baptist. I'm gonna talk about the man. I'm gonna talk about the message. And then I'm gonna talk about the mandate or the, the mantle he was carrying. Uh, we pastors, we like to use acronyms or 
Today I'm using the letter M today to, uh, to drive my point home this morning on this message. But when it comes to the man, we see here that John, he was a man of prayer. Um, again, he, you know, we'll see here that he came out of the desert. Uh, he came out of seclusion. He, uh, I'm sure he was not secluded. He was not by himself, but, but uh, he was not your typical preacher. He, he did not fit the typical uh, description or look or sound of a priest of his day. Even though he was in the lineage of priests, yet the word tells us that uh, he appeared in camel skin with a leather strap tied around his waist. He would eat dried grasshoppers and wild honey. <laughs> Uh, he, he had long hair. Uh, he, was, he had taken the vow of a Nazarite. Um, he did not look and, uh, typical. He did not fit into the culture of his day. But what happened was we see that he was a man of prayer. We know this because in Luke chapter 11, 1, the disciples of Jesus said to Jesus one day, Lord, teach us to pray as John taught his disciples. And so we know that John was a man of prayer. When it comes to the man himself, he was a man that spent time in the presence of God. John was not just a man of prayer, but John was one uh, that was convinced of who God is and who he and who and whose he was. Meaning, he was he was a believer. He was a son of God. He was a, a you know a believer in the Messiah, and he was uncompromised. He was convinced of who God is and whose he was. The word tells us. Uh, in Luke 1, 14 and 15, that, you know, he consecrated himself. Um, he was separated. Um, he was filled with the Holy Spirit. Uh, we'll see that later on in this message today, but he was full of the Holy Spirit and power. Uh, he was known as, a, he was known for the Nazarite vow, meaning that he was disciplined in uh, what he would and would not do. Uh, if the Lord said, John, they might, but you're not going to. He was more sensitive. He, he cherished his walk with God more than he cherished trying to please people, trying to please man. And so he took upon himself a vow uh, to remain in a place where he could hear God's voice, uh, where his conscience would be clear, where his spiritual sensitivities would be alive and sensitive to hear God when he spoke, that when he would get up to speak, that he could speak with, with power, authority, compassion, uh, it would bring healing, it would bring encouragement. And then John was a, John, John was a man of action. Uh, we see him baptizing people. He would, be, he would preach and then he would baptize. Preach and then baptize. Uh, he was known as John the Baptist uh, or one translation says John the Immerser. Uh, he came, you know, part of, the, part of the response to repenting or evidence of repentance was that people would, would get baptized in water. And we'll see that Jesus would do it himself. Uh, baptism, uh, and you may have remember seeing it last Sunday in our online church, but baptism is an outward expression of an inward decision. We identify with baptism as, as dying, being buried, and rising again. Uh, and so John would baptize people as evidence of their change of heart, change of direction of their repentance. So that's John. And then we see his message. Uh, his message was a message of repentance, meaning you're going this direction and I want you to, you know, I'm calling you to turn around. Uh, basically he was saying, turn back to God, uh, turn to God, repent. Uh, you know, do not keep going the way that you've been going, but turn around. Walk away from the world. Walk away from sin. Let, you know, allow Christ to cut it off. Break the power of it over your lives. Um, this was a powerful term for turning your turning our life around and coming back to God to a holy God. And so he was calling people. He was saying, "Listen, the way you're going is the wrong way. Uh, what you're doing is leading you down a path that is a dead end." Uh, it brings no joy, brings no peace, brings no hope. He was calling people to repent. He says, repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. We see here in the New Testament that the kingdom of heaven is mentioned 238 times. Uh, John spoke of it. 
Jesus spoke of it. In fact, in Matthew 3, John says, repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. In, in Matthew chapter uh, 5, Jesus says it again, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. In other words, turn around and begin to walk in the path toward the kingdom of heaven. Uh, it's at hand, it's coming. It, it's, what, it, there is a future kingdom that we're gonna see physically in the future, but in the meantime, he says, whenever you see signs, wonders, miracles, salvations, healings, that is the kingdom of God in demonstration. In fact, Jesus was the personification of the kingdom of God. So he said, turn back, repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. The prophet Isaiah would then prophesy about him. We see it in verse three. Isaiah was referring to John when he prophesied. A thunderous voice, one will be crying out in the wilderness. When John showed up on the scene, it was like a crack of thunder in the evening sky or in a, in a, in a dark sky. How many of you have ever been in a thunderstorm? I love, personally, where I grew up, I love thunderstorms. Um, there's just something a little bit comforting as well as awe, I'm awestruck by it as well. Um, but his voice, his, his, his preaching was like the crack of a thunder splitting the silence uh, in the air. And we see here that Isaiah prophesied saying he would come just as that, as one crying out, as one lifting up his voice. And what would he say? Verse three, prepare yourselves for the Lord's coming. And it would say, be said of him, he would prepare us for the Lord's coming and level a straight path inside your hearts for him. Uh, John's ministry would be basically to clear a path. He would talk about making the high places low and the low places high and the crooked places straight. John's preaching and John's demonstration of, of authority and intimacy with God would, would prepare people to receive the Messiah, to receive Jesus. And so he broke the silence. Think about it this way. And this is what I'm challenged, this is what I'm challenged with today, and this is what I'm challenging you with today. When you speak the word of God, and don't think that, you know, you may think, well, I'm unworthy, and who am I? And and uh, you know, that's that's for the preacher, that's for the evangelist, that's for the teacher, the, the leader in my local church. No, every one of us, God is calling to break this silence. Because when you break the silence, John was known as a prophet and an evangelist. When you break the silence, you are creating opportunities for people to receive Jesus. You are making those overwhelming mountains low. You're making those pitfalls, you're filling them in. You're making the crooked roads straight. You are, you are creating an opportunity. You are speaking God's word. You're clearing up confusion. You're clearing up misunderstandings. You're clearing up misconceptions. You're, you're removing the lies of the enemy from their life. The devil's just whispering to people time and time again, you're worthless, you're no good, you're damaged goods, you'll never amount to anything. There's no hope and no future for you. Um, you know, the enemy's always feeding these lies to people, everyday people, people you work with on the job, people you visit, uh, you know, you see in the marketplace or at the grocery store. Um, and so many times, and I can say this because I have spoken to so many people over my life and began to just share the simple gospel of how Jesus loves them, how he came and walked in their shoes, how he took their pain and their sorrow and their sin. And as we talked about last week, took it and with him to the cross. And when he died, those things were buried and forgiven and forgotten. And when people begin to understand the true gospel, it creates a clear path for salvation. It, it is amazing uh, to me that, it, that whenever I've spoken to individuals that hear really the simple gospel for the first time, they will say, you know what? I never understood it that way. I've heard bits and pieces here and there Uncle Tom said this, and Joe said that, and, and I heard someone on TV say this, and uh, someone shared me their opinion about how to get to heaven. Someone said, you know, someone, you know, they may say, well, someone tells me that all roads lead to heaven. I'm here to tell you there's only one path, 
(laughs) One road, one way, and his name is Jesus. Amen? And so when you just step out, open your mouth, it begin and, and speak the simple word of God. Say, you know what? Jesus loves you. He died for you. He made a way for you. It begins to remove all the barriers, removes all the doubt, removes the questioning and the reluctancy, you know, when it comes to understanding what God did. And when you do that, you're creating opportunities. You're clearing a way for the kingdom of God to come to that person, for them to realize how much Jesus loves them, how much God loves them and, wants to, and what he wants to do for their life. The word says here in Matthew chapter seven, verse 12 through 14, I won't read the whole thing, but, but basically it says, be careful to treat others the same way you'd wanna be treated. And then you jump down, it says, for the, the, the narrow, there's a, for, to, we're to enter, you know, the, the gate that we're entering is a narrow gate because the wide gate and broad path is the way that leads to destruction. Nearly everyone chooses that crowded road. The narrow gate and the, and the difficult way leads to etern- eternal life, and so few find it. What is, what is it, Jesus saying there in that? He, he's talking about showing people the love of God, telling the truth in love. He says, first of all, treat others the way you would like to be treated. And in, in, in so doing, understand this, that there is a broad path that so many are taking the path of least resistance, the path of, let's say, ignorance, meaning they don't, they don't realize there's a better way. And that better way is such a narrow path. It's one way, it's Jesus. But when you share it in love, when you tell the truth in love, when you, you're clearing the path, you're making it very visible, very understandable for someone to walk that path and experience eternal life. Um, you know, John, not only did he preach the, the gospel about the Messiah, but in so doing, his ministry would bring together families, not just individuals, but families. Uh, That was was a sign of of his message or his ministry. I believe it's a precursor. I believe that it is also true today that an evidence that God is in our midst, an evidence that God is speaking and that that the, the, the silence is being broken is when families are being restored. The word tells us in Luke 1.16, uh, regarding this ministry of John, uh, it says he will go, verse 17 says, he will go before the Lord as a forerunner with the same power as an anointing as the prophet Elijah. He will be instrumental in turning the hearts of the fathers in tenderness back to their children and the hearts of the disobedient back to the wisdom of of their righteous fathers. And he will prepare a united people who are ready for the Lord's appearing. In other words, that this this breaking of the silence, speaking the word of God, saying this is what God is saying about you, saying about your family. He says it will, the evidence of John's ministry, of what he was doing, it would actually restore marriages it would restore the relationship between fathers and sons and daughters and mothers and and bring families together. I'm gonna pause here and share something with you that I would say is for our church, Hermiston Assembly, and the Hermiston Umatilla community. I believe that God is speaking to us today about family. Um, In fact, next Sunday, uh, we're gonna kick off a series, we're calling it Family Matters. And you don't wanna miss that series as we, as we get into uh, what does it mean to do family? What does it mean to, uh, to, to live in a place of victory in, and peace in the family? Um, we're gonna begin sharing what we believe God is saying to the church today about revival in the home. Uh, I believe that, um, that what God wants to do is supernatural. I believe that what God wants to do is is it, it brings a spirit of restoration. It restores marriages. It restores relationship. Why? Because it's the word of God. It's Jesus. Um, it will bring, it will bring, I believe that what God wants to do is bring purity back in the home. He wants to uh, bring a, a, you know, the return to innocence, the return to purity, all of this by the spirit of God. He wants to, he wants to empower the home. 
He wants to empower the husband and the wife, the mom and the dad, the kids. He wants to empower them uh, by, you know, by his word and by his Holy Spirit. Um, how many of you know that there is no junior Holy Spirit? The same experiences that we as adults have, our children can have. God can use our kids. God's used my kids to minister to me countless times when they don't even, to this day, they don't even know some of the times, some of the things they have said or done that has brought encouragement to me. And so I believe that what God wants to do in the day that we live in is, is raise up families in, to such a place where there is a freedom in the home to share what Jesus is doing in every life. Every family member, I believe, has been brought into God's kingdom, not just as sons and daughters, but even as kings and priests. I heard it said this way many months ago, about the time COVID started, I heard one uh, woman minister say it this way, revival isn't revival until it comes to my house, until it comes to your house. Our house, our home, should be a place where moms and dads, sons and daughters can have a free expression of the presence of God as defined by the word of God. I believe that our home should be a place where we can worship together and pray together and go to God's word together and experience the victories and the breakthroughs together. That's what John's word was about. That's why he came and broke the silence. I find that the very thing that God wants to restore in the day we live in is the very thing that we see happening in society that, that society, and this has not been going on this has been going on for generations, even decades now, but it's come to a, a, a critical mass, it's come to a fever pitch where there is active, uh, you know, the enemy is actively trying to dismantle the family. Why? Because he knows that if, he, if, if God can restore the family, he can restore a people, he can restore a nation. He can dis make disciples of a nation. And so church, when you think about it, it begins not on a Sunday morning at 10.30 a.m., but rather church begins at home. Church begins with mom and dad praying together, sons and daughters praying together, reading together. Maybe you're a family of one. It's you in your home praying and going before God and watching what he'll do in your life. And so whether you're a married couple with kids or a single parent or, or just an individual, uh, whatever the case is, whatever defines your family at this time, God wants to bring revival to it. Um, again, I believe that an indication of revival in these last days is when family and families are being restored, being made whole. And so we see here that it's ironic that when in this passage, that while John's ministry was typified by the restoration of family, and I believe that that is the same case here today, because I, I, I say that because John was a forerunner to the first appearance of Christ. I believe that living in those moments leading up to his second return, that we will see a restoration of family. Therefore, we will see revival. Therefore, we will see harvest. It, has a, it will be like a ripple effect. It has, a, it has a, uh, an effect on society, an effect on our communities. And it's ironic that he would talk about, in essence, his message would be about family. But we see here that he would then turn and give a rebuke or a correction to people who were, in essence, spiritual orphans. Uh, the word tells us here that, uh, that John would then turn in verse 7 and he would refer to these Sadducees and Pharisees. He would call them offspring of vipers. Uh, it's, viper can also be defined as scorpion. Um, I don't know if you know this. I only found this out in my studies here. But a male scorpion dies. You know, After it mates, it dies. The female scorpion, after she gives birth to scorpions, she also dies. So when that scorpion is born... It's born an orphan, fatherless, motherless. And John here, in essence, is referring to these, spiritual, these Pharisees as spiritual orphans. He says, who, who warned you? Oftentimes, I find in the New Testament that the only people who ever kind of really came under rebuke were the religious. 
people who thought they could do it themselves, people who were gonna do it their way. But we see here that Jesus, as well as John, they would rebuke these Pharisees and Sadducees because they were living as orphans. But then they would make the excuse, they would say, but we're, verse nine, but we're the sons of Abraham. We're the descendants of Abraham. Isn't it interesting that they would make that claim? Uh, it, actually, when it comes to the claim they made, uh, the word sons in the Hebrew and the word stones in the Hebrew is virtually the same word. In other words, that John would go on to say, I tell you, God can make these stones to become sons to Abraham. He was in essence saying, just because you're descendants of him doesn't make, the, make you his sons. John at the riverbank of Jordan, as he's baptizing people, he's, he's dripping wet as he's pointing out these religious people and saying, who warned you about the coming judgment? Who warned you, uh, uh, you know, that, that the Messiah was coming? Uh, he, he, I'm sure it, in that moment, he picked up a couple stones and said, you know what? I don't care if you're the sons of Abraham. I don't care if you uh, have you know, documents proving that, that you're of the lineage of Abraham. That is not what saves you. God could take these stones and cause them to worship him. And so God builds his house with sons, not stones. Um, we see here he would even go even a step further. He would say the ax is now ready to cut down the tree at its very root. What it was he saying was, he says, you may have a, what looks like a tree, but yet if it's fruitless, it says every fruitless rotten tree will be chopped down and thrown into the fire. He says this ax, what was the ax? It's, it's a, basically a type and a picture of the word of God that judges our hearts. You know what, I just recently discovered this. I'll see if it is true, but I was out in my backyard a few days ago looking at all the trees and I noticed that I have one tree that of all the trees, this one tree has no leaves on it. And it makes me wonder if that tree's dead. Uh, I'll give it a, a little bit more time and we'll see what happens. But, but Jesus, or John said here, for every tree that does not bear fruit, the ax is going to take it out. Um, was God being, you know, was John being rude in this case? No. In fact, when he opened his mouth, he was speaking the truth. He was speaking it in love. Um, you'll see here that as time would go on, that even in the life and times of Jesus, that many of the priests and Pharisees and Sadducees would come to Jesus and accept him as the Messiah. And then we have lastly, I've, said, I've talked about the man, his message, but then we have the mantle. What is the mantle? The mantle is the Holy Spirit, is the empowerment of the Holy Spirit. John says this, those who repent, I will baptize in water, but there's coming after me a man who is more powerful than I. In fact, I'm not even worthy to pick up his sandals and he will submerge you into union with the, holy, with the spirit of holiness and with raging fire. And with raging fire. He, who was he talking about? He's talking about Jesus. He's saying, I'm baptizing you as evidence of your repentance for sin. But he says, there's one coming after me that when he comes, he will baptize in the Holy Spirit and with fire, unquenchable fire, raging fire. He also will have a winnowing fork in his hand. It's kind of like a pitchfork that farmers will use when they're, when they're breaking up the chaff on wheat and then they'll take it and throw it in the air. Should I say the old farmers? They, we have technology for that these days, but in those days they would take this fork and throw it in the air and the wind would blow away the chaff. And so John here is saying that he wants to baptize us. He wants to fill us with this Holy Spirit and with this fire. Holy Spirit for empowerment, but fire for purging. Uh, it, to purge away the things that, to purge away the chaff, to purge away the things that are, that are nothing but distractions, nothing but things that hold us back um, from being able to speak a clear word. That's what I'm saying. When, you've been, when you're willing to, be, to go through the fire, when you're willing to be, to, to, to carry the Holy Spirit in your life, when you're willing to say, Lord, 
Purge me, make me new, make me clean. It is out of that that comes this certain sound. It's out of that that comes a voice, the voice of God, the voice of the Holy Spirit that breaks the silence, that you're not speaking out of your own wisdom, out of your own strength, but rather you're speaking as it were the very breath of God. We see here that in the ministry of John that people from all walks of life came to hear this certain sound. They came to the riverbank by the hundreds, if not thousands. The word says in Luke 3.10 that these people, it says multitudes came and, they, and, they all, and all these people asked the same question. They said to John, they said, what shall we do? They heard the word of the Lord. They heard the, the word of God. They heard the message that God was giving for the first time in 400 years. And their question was, what shall we do? Luke 3.12 says the tax collectors showed up and they said the same thing. They said, teacher, what shall we do? In Luke 3.14, in that same chapter, soldiers, we're talking about Roman soldiers, they showed up and they said, what shall we do? Peter on the day of Pentecost, after the death and, and resurrection of Jesus, 50 days later, the word says that Peter was preaching to a crowd of 3,000 plus, and when they heard this, Acts chapter two, verse 37, and when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? What shall we do? When you share the love of Jesus, when you share the truth in love, when you, when you open your mouth, you know what, sometimes that's all it takes is our willingness to open our mouth. I think that's the biggest hurdle, the biggest fear in the life of any believer is that initial opening the mouth, saying, you know what? There's a God that loves you. There's a God that cares about you. There's a God that, that has provided salvation for you. When we open our mouth, the Holy Spirit, in fact, let me say it this way, that is what the Holy Spirit acts upon. In the beginning of creation, God said, let there be light. He said, let there be firmament. Let there be night and day. Let there be animals. And it was upon God's word when it was spoken that the Holy Spirit acted on it and it became so. And so when you speak the word of God, when you open your mouth and you begin to share a scripture or a truth from God's word to someone who's broken, someone who does, who does not know Jesus, God the Holy Spirit takes those words and begins to speak to their heart and even, and even begins to reveal things to them beyond what you have just said. It is the Holy Spirit that takes it and empowers those words. And what was, and what is, and what was the response beyond what shall we do? What, Peter said it this way. He says, repent. In other words, turn away from your sin, turn away from this path that's leading you to hell, leading you to destruction, despair, loneliness, heartache, repent, turn around, let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus. In other words, identify with his death, burial, resurrection. Realize that he paid the price for our sins. And he goes, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. In other words, you shall receive not only forgiveness, but the empowerment to go and tell somebody else, to go and be witnesses to what God just has done in your life. I don't care if you've been a believer for 50 years or for five days. God says, open your mouth, break the silence, speak a word by speaking his word, sharing your testimony. He says, it will make the high places low, the low places high. It will make those crooked paths straight. It will, it will create a path for someone else to receive and accept Jesus as their savior, as their healer, as their comforter. And so I want to encourage you today, open your mouth, break the silence. Don't be silent any longer. When, when someone's sharing a need in their life, saying, you know what, my marriage is a wreck, my kids are on drugs, I feel so lonely. Don't just stand there. Don't just say, well, I don't wanna get involved. I don't wanna 
you know, I don't wanna get involved in that or that's his business, that's none of my business. That's a lie of the enemy right there because that is, the, that is your opportunity to break the silence, to say, hey, I have the answer. I know the answer to your problems and his name is Jesus. It all comes back to Jesus. I don't care what the issue is. I cannot overstate it. I cannot exaggerate what Jesus can do. He is the answer for everything that we need. He's the answer for the world. He's the answer for the world. And so if you're with me today and you've been hearing this word, I'm telling you, Jesus is the answer. And I wanna give you an opportunity to accept him, to know him, to, to uh, be a son of God, to be a daughter, to be in the family, to no longer be an orphan. Turn away from your religiousness. Turn away from your sin. Turn away from your way of doing things and say yes to him. Amen? And so if you're with me today and you wanna pray this prayer to accept Jesus, do it with me right now. Today is your day of salvation. Pray these words with me. God, thank you for sending your only son. Jesus, thank you for walking in my shoes. Thank you for taking the punishment for me. Thank you for paying the price for me. I deserve, dear God, as the word says, my destiny was hell. My future was hell. I was taking the, I was taking the path of, uh, of least resistance. I was following the crowd. But Lord, I realize in hearing the gospel today that there is a clear and straight path to receive Jesus. And I wanna receive you today. I ask you to come in my heart, forgive me my sin, make my heart your home from this day forward. And Lord, put, put, put a fire in my heart that I would open my mouth and break the silence over others who are blind and lost, sick and broken. In Jesus' name I pray, amen and amen. If you prayed that prayer with me this morning, I wanna say congratulations. And I encourage you, go tell somebody. Go clear the path for somebody else. Let them know of the decision you just made. Let them know the change that is going on in your heart right now. You've gone from darkness to light, from separation to knowing God. You're experiencing a, a renewed heart, a new heart, I should say, from this day forward, amen? If you made that decision, will you do this for me, with me? Will you go to hermesonassembly.com forward slash salvation? Fill out that form. We wanna celebrate with you. We have a gift for you. We wanna give a Bible to everybody who makes that decision. We wanna connect with you and help you on the next step. Uh, this is not the end result, this is the beginning of a new life for you, amen? God bless. I look forward to talking to you soon, seeing you soon, in Jesus' name. What a great message from Pastor Terry. We hope that it's impacted your life. Let us know what your favorite part of the message was in the comment section below as we transition over to Pastor Austin for our Elevate Kids lesson.
Hey, good morning, Elevate Kids. I'm so glad you're back for another week of church at home, church online. If you're on YouTube or Facebook, thanks for joining us. We're so excited you are here. And let's recap a little bit because last week was a super amazing weekend. It was Easter. We talked all about Jesus and why we celebrate Easter. And we're gonna keep talking a little bit about that. But one thing that I really wanna say before we get started in today's lesson is this, that Jesus was like this bridge that connected us to God. We were on one side of this huge canyon and God is on the other side and Jesus is like this bridge that connected us. And for the rest of the month of April, we are going to talk about this idea of reconnecting, reconnecting to God. And it all started at Easter when Jesus became that bridge to reconnect us back to God. He actually made us at peace with God. There was a time, and we talked about it last week, when we were not at peace with God because we had sinned and we had disobeyed him, but Jesus brought us to peace with God. And we're going to continue talking about peace, and we're going to continue talking about reconnecting um, with God and with each other. So I'm so thankful you're here, but let's get into today's lesson. Like I said, we are talking about peace, and this word peace and what we're going to talk about it today means this, proving you care more about each other than winning an argument. Proving you care more about each other than winning an argument. Have you ever been in an argument before, Elevate Kids? I have been in plenty of them. And let me tell you, when I'm arguing with somebody, I'm not at peace with them. I'm fighting with them. I'm angry at them or I'm mad at them. And I'm not at peace with them. But the Bible actually tells us that we need to be at peace with one another. We need to be at peace with one another. Paul, this really cool guy in the New Testament, actually wrote a ton about this in the Bible. In Colossians chapter 3, verse 15, he said this, Let the peace that Christ gives you rule in your hearts. As parts of one body, you were appointed to live in peace and to be thankful. Okay, I mean, it seems like that should be pretty simple for us to do, right? Just live in peace, get along, but it's not that easy. People disagree, we see things differently, we get frustrated, we get annoyed, we get on each other's nerves, and if we're not careful, we'll stop listening to each other all together. So what do we do? How do we do what Paul was saying? Live in peace like parts of one body. If you think about your body, it is all working together to make movements happen, right? So your body is living in peace. And in the same way, Paul tells us to live that same way with each other, with our brothers and our sisters and our cousins and our friends and even our strangers, that we are to live in peace like one another. Um, But if we're honest, you and I, we're kind of like these noodles. I brought some uncooked noodles with me this morning. As you can see, they're kind of hard. Uncooked noodles, they don't, they don't bend, they don't move. They're really stiff. They're kind of like a stick, right? But they are very, very hard. And I'm sure a lot of us, we're just like this. We're dry and we're crunchy. We're not willing to bend. We refuse to change our minds and we want things our way. And when we don't bend and when we're not flexible, we just kind of snap, right? We snap right in half. I'm sure you know what I'm talking about if you have brothers or sisters, but it even happens with our parents, our teachers, or our friends. We often disagree with each other, we argue, and sometimes we just snap, and we're not living in peace anymore. Our relationships with others can bend and bend and bend until they break. But God didn't make us to stay like that. He created us to live in peace, just like Paul was talking about. So how do we do that when we so easily disagree? Have you guys ever cooked pasta before? Have you ever cooked some dry noodles, some uncooked noodles? When you cook them, they get soft and they get flexible and you can move them around. Have you ever had top ramen before? It's just like that. The noodles go from dry and hard and crunchy to soft and bendable and flexible. If we want to make peace, there's something that we need to do. Just like those noodles, we add hot water to them to make them, um, to make them flexible and bendable. But here's the thing, you and I, we have to ask God's help in order for us to live at peace with one another. It's not just something that we can do on our own. We are to to ask God, we're to pray, God, I want to live in peace with the people around me. Will you help me do that? Holy Spirit, will you help me to do that? Remember, that's what Paul wrote in his letter. If you look at the last half of that verse that we read, he said, let the peace that Christ gives you rule in your hearts. 
There was a gap between us and God because of sin and the things that we do wrong. But God sent his only son, Jesus, to earth. And we know that Jesus lived a perfect life, but then he took our place and our sin when he died on the cross. And then he rose from the dead, which is what we celebrated last week on Easter. And when we put our trust in Jesus as our savior, he reconnects us to God. It's like he builds a bridge over our sin so it no longer separates us from God. And because of what Jesus did, we can have peace with God and we can have peace with others. Not only does it bring us peace with God, but it brings us peace with others. He created us to make peace with others. The second part of that verse says, as parts of one body, you were appointed to live in peace and to be thankful. Appointed to live in peace. That means God designed us to live in peace with one another. So you and I have a choice to make, Elevate Kids. We can choose to stop focusing only on what we want. Instead, we can remember what Jesus did for us, and we can choose to stop being so dry and crunchy and unbendable like these noodles, right? Our relationship with God can change us so we can make peace with others. Then we can work together the way that God planned for us to do. Choosing peace isn't easy, Elevate Kids. That's because if we want to truly make peace with others, we often have to give up something ourselves, and many of us don't want to do that. But it helps when we stop to think about what Jesus did for us. Jesus gave up his life so we could have peace with God. And the peace we have from him will make us want to make peace with others. So be the first one, Elevate Kids, to say you're sorry. Be the one who gives up what you want so you can have peace with others. Remember, God made us work, God made us to work together with other people. And the bottom line is this, we can make peace with others. So Elevate Kids, would you pray with me and we can ask God to help us live at peace with those around us, with our brothers and our sisters and our cousins and friends and even those people that we don't really get along with, let's ask God to help us. So would you pray with me? God, thank you so much that you sent Jesus to bring us peace with you. And God, thank you that he made it possible that we could have peace with others. So God, help us to to get along with those people in our lives, even that we have trouble getting along with and even with those that we might fight with and argue with sometimes. God, bring us peace in those relationships. God, we thank you and we love you in Jesus' name. Everybody said amen. Elevate Kids, thank you so much for joining us for another week here at Church at Home. I'll see you right back here next week. Thanks again for joining us this morning, church family. We hope to see you again next week as we begin our new series. Have a great day. Woo!